vaccines. They will be honored by the Institute this week at the Franklin Institute's award ceremony this Thursday evening. The laureates join a nearly 200 year old legacy at the Institute that includes many giants of science history. Marie Curie, Nikolai Tesla, Orville Wright, Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, in modern greats like Jane Goodall, Robert Langer, Jim Allison, Bill Gates, and Francis Arnold. With a mission to inspire a passion for learning about science and technology, the Franklin Institute is proud to be the most visited museum in Pennsylvania and a national leader in STEM education. As the Institute emerges from the pandemic, we're thrilled to see our Science Center bustling again with activity. From our engaging exhibits to immersive programs for middle and high school students, to the magic of Harry Potter, the exhibition, to this Thursday night, the return to in person, the award ceremony. Extremely exciting and would not have happened without the two individuals you're gonna hear about in a moment and hear from. Tonight's program officially kicks off our Franklin Institute Awards Week, which includes a series of events featuring the 2022 laureates in engaging our community in informative discussions around their exceptional achievements in science and engineering. I can't say it enough. Without the individuals you're gonna hear from tonight, we would not be gathering again in person. If ever we know the importance of science and technology, these past two years have showed us just how important that is. And the Institute takes very seriously its job to highlight and honor the greatest women and men in science. Guiding tonight's conversation is our own Chief Astronomer Derek Pitts, who for decades has shared her curi his curiosity about science and technology and communicates it better than anyone to the masses. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Derek Pitts. Derek, thank you. And all of you, thanks for joining us tonight as we kick off 2022 Awards Week at the Franklin Institute. Thank you, Larry, and good evening, everyone. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Benjamin Franklin medalist, Dr. Catalin Carrico, and Dr. Drew Weissman, whose extraordinary research resulted in the development of an mRNA platform that could successfully deliver instructions to the body's immune system to combat viruses. Their pioneering work in mRNA vaccine delivery systems was essential for the unparalleled speed of development of COVID-19 vaccines. In our discussion tonight, we'll learn how their work with messenger RNA evolved to be just what was needed for the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccine, what the experience of the vaccine's development has been like for them, and how they see the mRNA technology being applied in the future. Let's do a little housekeeping though before we get started. Although we are virtual tonight and your mics are muted, we still wanna hear from you, our audience. Please share your thoughts and reflections in the chat. And if you have specific questions for Dr. Weissman or Dr. Carrico, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and type your question there. We really would like to hear from you. We hope you'll participate. So let's begin. Dr. Catalin Carrico is Senior Vice President of the biotech company, BioNTech, BioNTech. And lucky for Philadelphia, she's an adjunct professor at the, University, at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Drew Weissman is a professor of medicine also at the Perelman School of Medicine at Penn. Also again, lucky for us here in Philadelphia. Together they are the winners of the 2022 Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Sciences. And I'd like to say good evening and extend my congratulations to Dr. Carrico and Dr. Weissman. And thank you both for being with us tonight. Good evening. Good evening, thank you. Thank you. So let me begin by asking you about why you chose to pursue mRNA research when there was so much better funding in other areas like gene therapy research when you started this work about 15 years ago? And weren't there already other alternatives for vaccines in use? And I mean, for me, the messenger RNA interest started in 1989 or 1990 when I started to make uh, messenger RNA thinking that uh, 
many of the cells is, um, you know, maybe need some kind of uh, protein, which is not enough. So I didn't want to inject any foreign material, no, uh, you know, cancer, uh, vaccines like for uh, viral antigen or cancer antigen. I wanted to inject uh, RNA, which is naturally there, but not sufficiently amount certain places. And that's uh, how I started. So I did not want to uh, do gene therapy, which was, you know, most uh, at that time was more uh, favorable. And it was about, you know, that when they, the gene uh, 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 genome sequencing occurred and they discovered different uh, genome uh, errors. And then was the idea that introduced the corrected genome by viruses and by DNA. And I did not want to permanent change. I just want to transiently change. Ah, I see. Dr. Weissman? Well, I joined Katie, I think it was around 1997, 98. And I'm an immunologist. And I, I was interested in vaccines. I was interested in other therapeutics as a physician. Uh, but I, I was mostly interested in using RNA as part of a vaccine platform. And that's where we started working together. And over the next eight years, we, we, we figured out that RNA was highly inflammatory. We figured out why, and we figured out how to overcome that. And that, that led to our big finding of modified RNA. Well, can you talk a little bit about why you had to alter the, the RNA, and how did you make that change? How did you alter it so that it would be usable for vaccines? I have to say that um, up until meeting Drew, I, I was already started working with RNA. I did not realize that this, uh, I never thought about that it would be any problem because I just wanted to overexpress the protein, which you already we have in our body. I didn't thought about that uh, it could be, you know, inflammatory. I never thought RNA is already present in the body. So um, up until uh, gave the RNA to Drew and who had these very special cells, uh, Im human immune cells, they call dendritic cells. And he added the uh, RNA and realizing that it uh, induced many inflammatory molecules. I was not aware of that. And I have to say again that I learned all of the immunology from Drew at that point, because whatever I learned in school, it outdated and the immunology is just changing so fast that, you know, one, two years and it is uh, whatever we learned, it's not true anymore. And so I learned all of this immunology from Drew and I had never heard about the dendritic cells which he could generate. And so, um, and uh, realizing that human cells is so sensitive for this RNA, uh, made me that uh, I want to use the RNA for human therapy, and that is no good that if it is inflammatory. Mm -hmm. when, when Katie first gave me the RNA, I, I didn't expect it to be inflammatory. And, and this was well before many or really most of the sensors for RNA were known. So when I added the RNA to the dendritic cells and looked a couple of hours later, I could see they were highly activated. And, and that just struck me as, you know, why the cells are full of RNA. Uh, so that then we spent a, a bunch of years figuring out what made RNA inflammatory and how to overcome it. And one of the help we got when we uh, delivered RNA, which has a uh, transfer RNA, and which has a lot of uh, nucleoside modification, it seemed that when we deliver to this uh, very sensitive human dendritic cells, human immune cells, it was uh, no inflammatory molecules were uh, secreted by the cells. So it seemed that, you know, the tRNA is not immunogenic, not inflammatory. And because uh, uh, like a quarter of the nucleoside inside this tRNA is uh, nucleoside modified, the idea came that could it be that modification suppress immunogenicity of the RNA? And uh, so that's what we try to figure out now that, okay, if it is true, how we can prove it, how we can make nucleoside modified RNA. So uh, all of the question we ask and the later how we purify this RNA and so on, everything was that nobody has done before and we had to figure out. And of course, what was very interesting and important for us that uh, 
Drew wanted to overexpress the viral antigen. I wanted to overexpress the protein, um, which is therapeutic protein. So it was important that the RNA should be translatable and non-immunogenic. So we asked so many things from this uh, RNA. And uh, so, and nobody at that point, we didn't know that it is doable or there is such RNA can be made. Can, can you do one thing for, for me? Uh, you know, I'm an astronomer at the Franklin Institute and this work is absolutely fascinating, but there's certainly some details about this that are way over my head. So if you'll help me out just a little bit, can you just uh, do a quick review of the, the roles of DNA to mRNA to tRNA uh, and to the protein, just so, we, just so I can have a better understanding of how that works? Um, I, I I can say that probably Drew and me we didn't we don't know too too many things about the stars. It is just far away, and uh, we can see during the evening, but <laughs> we don't know much about it. Them, but, well, you'll uh, forgive me for uh, for being an astronomer <laughs> in this position. Thank you. Yes, but <laughs> but um, really, in uh, sixty years ago, you know when messenger RNA was discovered, when scientists before that, they realized that in the nuclei, there is the DNA, but the protein, which is the, our building block, is made in the cytoplasma, is another compartment in our cells. And they didn't know that how the information will get there. And they suspected that some kind of, uh, like the RNA can do it because already they knew from virus studies that RNA can code for protein. So they suspected, but it was very difficult to isolate and to prove it. And that's what the first paper actually 60 years ago was published in Nature. Both had in the title that unstable. So the RNA was so unstable, so it was difficult to, to prove that it exists. So that from the, in the nuclei, from the DNA, there is a copy made from the DNA, which called RNA. And it is a copy of, of this uh, protein certain cells has to make it, and they are coming out from the nuclei, going to the cytoplasma, where is the protein factory are, and then it is just reading the order of the nucleotides, and then based on it, makes a protein, and those protein will be secreted or building the cells or so on. So that's a very fundamental information flow, which we understand that from the DNA, there is an RNA and the protein. And the mRNA very quickly degrade. And if you need more protein, you make more RNA in your body. Ah, okay, thank you very much. That that helps. It's a little bit better for me. <laughs> so that's great. Well, maybe, maybe Drew, you want to add, add something? Uh, you know, it, it, it's the middleman. It, it, it's what takes the code and brings it to a machine that makes protein. Uh -huh. Okay, great. That's, that's great. That really works for me. Thank you very much. But Dr. Weissman, I want to ask, you said that, you know, you did years of work to get from one place to the next place. What was it that kept you going through those years? Yeah, so my family would say it's stubbornness. Um, it, 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 it's more likely, you know, so research is never success all the time. It, it's constantly I don't understand what these results mean. And some people just give up on the experiment and move on to something else. Katie and I are not like that. When we didn't understand an experiment, we tried to figure out what it really meant. And we kept doing that. And we kept getting positive results. You know, it, it wasn't that nothing ever worked because then it would have been foolish to keep going. We kept getting positive results but we also kept not quite understanding what was going on. And that just kept us wanting to investigate more, wanting to research more and to keep pushing on. Well, this, Actually, this... I had a wall in, in our laboratory, a quote from Leonardo da Vinci that the experiment never aired, only your expectation. <laughs> so that you expected the results for an experiment you have not performed. <laughs> So this was truly a step-by-step -step process. And uh, would you say that, that this process is, is far closer to being a, a truer definition of, uh, of how science research works? You know, I think many people have, you know, as you, as you were pointing to Dr. Weissman, many people have this idea that science is, uh, you know, an endeavor where you, 
go do something once and then there's a miraculous you know development and you're done yeah science never works that way science is the combination of thousands and thousands of people each contributing a small piece of new knowledge of new understanding and then researchers build on that knowledge and make their own hypotheses and keep building. And, and that's what Katie and I did. We took you know, 50, 45 years of prior knowledge of RNA and we built upon it. Um, and that's how we got to where we are. Well, speaking of uh, of all this work that you've done together, you know the 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 story is that you that you both met at a, a Xerox machine in uh, in Penn there uh, when the someone had to you know whoever got there first got to use the machine and uh, Dr. Kariku, you you held on to your code from time before when you were working there and this is how you met Dr. Weissman, uh, but can you can you just share with us a little bit about what it's like for the two of you to work together. What is it that's complementary about your work together? I, uh, uh, I might say uh, that I work with RNA and uh, I had this knowledge and Drew work with immune cells. He want to make vaccine and, and uh, we educated each other. So I taught Drew R about RNA and other things, cloning what I was doing and I learned from, and then we tried to figure out how we can work together. And what was interesting is because uh, I couldn't get any funding and Drew didn't have at the beginning much of the money and later also it was kind of difficult to get for it. So what happened is that many of the experiments we did uh, with our hands. So Drew was preparing the cells and I was making the RNA and we lean over the result. And, and so it was a lot of hands-on. So it's not like we ask students, I have never had a student so that it was, uh, we did these experiments and get the excitement. And if uh, we, we would meet uh, in like 2002, I, I would not be going to the Xerox machine anymore because every paper I downloaded digitally. So I wouldn't meet uh, Drew, but in uh, 1997, I still had to Xerox and uh, I was working at neurosurgery, but you know, the Xerox machine was uh, not there, but <laughs> it was at the, my, prior workplace and uh, and I recognized that Drew is a new guy there and then I just uh, you know started to talk to him <laughs> bragging about my work this is like I am and although we are very different people you know that by nature but when we it was science you know we were just so excited and we cut each other word because this is means that what should we do how should we? so it was a uh, always very exciting time. And recently we just remember that even at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, we send an email and then the other is responded because we were up working and try to figure out because we had to read a lot of papers, how people did different works and try to come up with a new idea. Especially we worked a lot on how to purify this RNA because that was also a very important part we did. So it was fun. It sounds like it was to a work, lot. To work together, you know. Of course, certainly. That's great. Well, now the other thing that I've learned about your work is that when you, when you published your findings, uh, once you discovered how to really make this happen, it seems as if no one really took notice. Uh, and I wonder, what did it feel like? What did it feel like as you waited to hear some response? I mean, you probably are expecting that you'll get a lot of feedback. How did it feel to sit and wait for a while to get response from the community? So, you know, I, I said to Katie that the night before our paper was going to be published, that starting tomorrow, our phones are going to be ringing off the hook because we solved the problem of how you use RNA therapeutically. And we thought the world, researchers, biotech companies, pharmaceuticals would all wanna do it. And we, we got there the next day and the phone didn't ring in the next week and the next month. And you, we would get a, a, an occasional scattered call here and there, but there really wasn't much interest in mRNA. It, it may have been because 
pharmaceuticals had already been burned once when they tried RA vaccines. Uh, they had been burned when they tried siRNA, and they just had no interest. So it took you know a few years before people started using the modified RNA. In the meantime, we kept going. We kept making therapeutics. We kept publishing our results. We, we kept doing experiments. We didn't give up. And we did not sit back, as you just said, you know, that and listen and watch the uh, telephone to ring. <laughs> so we had so so much to do, and uh, that major thing was we realized uh, that um, you know our RNA contains some double-stranded RNA contaminants, and we have to get rid of it. And that was nobody before said that how to purify a long RNA which had these double-stranded contaminants and. Uh, I remember New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, I was there because I get a new a new idea, but uh, Drew was reluctant to, he also, he could when see patients and then coming back and we'd try the HPLC new columns and uh, new uh, ideas that how we could purify to make sure that the RNA is not degrading the one the, which is the desirable, but still we can remove the contaminants. Well, I'm, I'm glad you continued moving forward and I'm sorry it took so long, but <laughs> thank goodness you came to the conclusions you did. Let me just go back and ask a little bit about some earlier time in your life. Were you both interested in science as children? So, I mean, I, I, I was interested in science, engineering and math when I was uh, uh, you know, in elementary school and you know, and, and my teachers always noted this. I was always in, you know, the, the, the top rated science classes. Um, so y yes, I, I was always interested in science. I was also in elementary school already, actually in chemistry and in biology. And for, when I was 14 years old and eighth grade, I was third best in Hungary, in country, you know, that it was a big competition for a whole week was we competed and, I was the third best <laughs> oh. at age 14. And now we can look at back. And uh, I also, you know, those who are camp, summer camp together with after winning, uh, others are winning a local competition, turn out that they became scientists, uh, biologists, chemists, and physicians. So it seemed that we not enough to even go to high school. We have to go to the elementary school. Did you have uh, encouragement from your parents, from mentors, your teachers? Uh, Dr. Weissman, you said you, uh, you, your teachers recognized uh, very early on that this was a, an, an area of excellence for you. Yeah, no, I, I always had encouragement from my parents uh, wanting me to, to learn, wanting me to do better. Um, my, same with my teachers. Uh, I remember in sixth grade, now I'm, I'm 62 years old, so that's a long time ago. Uh, MIT had their first computer program that they developed and they brought that to a sixth grade class. And I was one of the members of the class that learned how to, how to write that program and, and to use computers when they were brand new. Wow. This kind of experience, what uh, Drew has also mentioned, you know, that I remember also elementary school and high school when others are uh, attending that uh, I feel the responsibility that we should reach out similarly because we, we were a recipient one day and now we have to help others. Well, let me, let me go back a little bit to your, um... Let me go back a little bit to your work with the mRNA. Uh, as we've already sort of established, you this was not an overnight sensation sort of thing. Uh, and how long was it before your modification began to sort of catch fire? I actually, our paper had to be discovered by others and used the modification and it took, uh, I think, 2010. So it, we published 2005. 2008, we published how good it translates. And it was like 2010 when, uh, you know, Derek Rossi and his team used it to generate induced pluripotent cells. So that was our paper had to be rediscovered this way. And then people, they, they took notice and then they helped us <laughs> this way that uh, 
recognized. So it was like um, five, five more years. So, so your work actually was being uh, applied before we came to the pandemic. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, there have been many, there, there have been clinical trials, uh, a lot of clinical development. You know, starting around 2010, modified RNA was being developed for clinical purposes. So people, that there weren't a lot of people, but there were people who saw the potential and who were working to make vaccines, make therapeutics, make other treatments. That was when Moderna was established and they started to develop products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how, so how did you find out about its application to COVID-19? Well, we, I mean, my lab started a couple months before the sequence was ever released. Um, I, I have friends at the Wuhan Virologic Institute, and I was talking to them November, December, uh, b before the sequence in 2019. And they were giving me a very different story than what was coming out of the government, that there were a lot of cases that people were getting sick and people were dying, and, and they were very concerned. So I, I'm in an ID division and we all became very concerned because this kind of rapid spread of an unknown virus is a major concern. I see, okay. So um, was it at that point that you realized it would be, that your work would be applied worldwide or, I mean, did, you, saw, you saw in that moment that here was an opportunity for this. We had been working on RNA LNP vaccines for over five years before COVID ever hit. Mm -hmm. We actually had five phase one clinical trials in process before COVID hit. So you know, we were developing this platform as a vaccine and that was based on our previous results. We had made probably around 20 different vaccines, 20 different diseases. And with just about every one of them, we had 100% protection from viral challenge. So we knew that it was a great vaccine and it had huge potential. The minute we learned that it was a, a coronavirus, we knew the vaccine would work. We knew it'd be a very easy vaccine to make. And we started immediately. And considering BioNTech, you know, we already started to work with Pfizer and uh, Albert Bula is a recipient of the leadership award uh, this uh, Thursday. So uh, we work with Pfizer from 2018. We already tried to develop together a uh, vaccine against influenza. And so we already were uh, developing a program for influenza, which was uh, turned over to be uh, COVID-19 vaccine instead of influenza. But, you know, it is uh, showing that how easy to uh, adjust uh, the mRNA technology, because you need just a new DNA template. Mm -hmm. And now that uh, you can just order a DNA template, if the this uh, pandemia would happen uh, 20 years ago, there were, you couldn't order DNA. Wow. And uh, you would need from Wuhan, somebody send you a sample that you can start work with. But uh, you know that uh, in these days now, it was enough, they're just uh, information. And uh, 100, mm -hmm. uh, 200 different places, people started to make uh, vaccines based on just the information because they could synthesize DNA and, and so on, and they could generate protein and whatnot, and RNA as well. So I'm going to pull a little bit on my astronomy experience uh, in this next sort of question for you. You know, I often think of, of how Galileo's thoughts must have raced through his brain that night as he looked through his very crude telescope and realized the implications of his discovery, seeing objects orbiting Jupiter and that sort of first realization of how this translates to the heliocentric theory of the solar system. And, um, you know, I, I, can just, I can just imagine him just 
thinking wildly about what all this means. So as you're listening to and seeing you know, what's beginning to emerge, how are you thinking about what your work has, has been able to bring forth you know, at, the, at the moment when you realize that now there's a much broader application that can be uh, used almost immediately? And I, I think a lot of this, so you know, I, I, I only look to the future. I, I, I never look to the past. And it, it upsets my wife because you know, she'll say, do you remember the, uh, our daughter's fifth birthday? And I'm saying, no, but I'm you know, thinking about a new therapy for, for tumors. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, when Katie and I first started working together, we started making lists of all of the things that we thought that RNA could be used for. And the list just went on and on and on. And you know, the, it seemed like an endless list. Now we're at that stage. RNA is in clinical development for a variety of therapeutics to treat heart disease, to treat cystic fibrosis, to treat urea cycle disorders in the liver, uh, lots of different vaccines. Uh, but you know, my lab, we're interested in the next generation of treatments. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to make CAR T cells in vivo. And, and what that means is it, it, you make CAR T cells in a laboratory from a patient. It costs a half a million dollars. It's such a complex process. We injected RNA LNPs, made CAR T cells in a half an hour and cured a disease in mice. We're working on doing gene therapy with a simple injection of RNA LNPs. So I think this is gonna change the future of medicine. It's gonna change gene therapy. It's gonna change RNA therapeutics. We're gonna have brand new treatments for a lot of diseases that up until now, we just didn't know what to do with or the, the cost of treatment were millions of dollars. For, for me, this Galileo feeling, you know, came first when when realizing that the modif the tRNA was not immunogenic, and all of the sudden that how we could prove it, how we can make, you know, and then all of the sudden comes the zillion question because I don't know much about, I mean, uh, on the how to make it. Another one was when uh, nucleoside modified RNA, the pseudo uridine containing RNA, which uh, first uh, when I made it. I immediately like uh, translating and realizing that so much more protein was made from that RNA hmm. compared to the conventional RNA. And it is like, I, I rush back to look at my chemistry book there and uh, seeing that uh, how it looks, I, I did not know that how pseudo it looks. <laughs> and I had to check that, how, how could it be? And I repeated the experiment. And, um, and then I was very anxious because actually I'd learned before knowing that whether it is non-immunogenic. So I gave it to Drew and uh, he tested out and we were very excited that it is non-immunogenic. Even more protein is made. It is like, you know, the icing on the cake. That <laughs> you wanted to make it non-immunogenic and now it is so much protein is made. It was just, uh, uh, now we can do the therapy. So this really feels like uh, that, as, as Dr. Weissman is pointing to, uh, Dr. Karaku, this sounds like you're really opening up the floodgates toward a future where there's so much more that can be uh, attended to, so many other uh, diseases, so many other viruses uh, for which you now might have a way to um, solve those issues and solve those problems. Can, so can we talk a little bit more about some of the future direction where we can go with this, where you, where you might be able to take this? Well, Barik, I might just mention that this future actually was already in the past because before the, as Drew mentioned, before the, it used as a vaccine in 2018, uh, February was already injected to the heart for the heart failure patient in the AstraZeneca and uh, uh, Moderna trial. And this is, was the most advanced because it was in phase two already. So mm -hmm. patients who are undergoing elective uh, bypass surgeries, their heart was injected with naked RNA containing a VGFA mRNA. What did that mRNA translated to the protein and made new blood vessels and made the heart functioning much better. 
And this was already 2018, so there were before the vaccine. And uh, actually in this January, it was uh, evaluated all of the patient who received this treatment. And it seems that it entered into the last phase of clinical trial, we will see it. And, uh, and other trials were already ongoing as uh, Drew mentioned. So actually some of the future is already tested, trust started you know, before the COVID. And it, it just, uh, you know, the, the need accelerated the process. And we have in um, 10 years already, we have RNA therapy meeting. And if you would attend to one of those, you would already, four years ago, we heard presentation about vaccine against um, uh, malaria, for example. So not just uh, viral pathogen, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, parasites and, and others, and you could see that how many different ways people try to use the messenger RNA, even before the COVID. It was just, you know, all of us is a slow process, and now all of a sudden other large companies realize that uh, there is a good opportunity, not just when the final product would be an RNA, but even if the final product is protein for screening, accelerates the development of the product. You know, I think the future of RNA is really enormous. There are so many different therapies. There are the, you know, the, the infectious disease vaccines. There are parasite vac vaccines, bacteria. People are making vaccines for food allergies, things like peanut allergies. They're making vaccines for autoimmune diseases. They're making, there, there's many therapies to treat genetic deficiency disorders. So everything from cystic fibrosis to uh, sickle cell anemia and many others. That there are therapies being developed to treat disorders, to treat heart attacks, as Katie said, to treat stroke, to treat lung inflammation, lung damage from COVID. The, the list just goes on and on. How many different things you can do with RNA? It, it, it truly is a floodgate. And even we already just uh, did a preview with Drew that uh, actually the promise of gene therapy actually might be delivered with mRNA. We could see that Intelia clinical trial for a disease which was uh, uh, amyloidosis, transthreatine amyloidosis, when a patient uh, uh, diagnosed and five years later, they already uh, might die. And then Intelia injected just only once uh, uh, Cas9 coding mRNA with the guide RNA, and they already with the three patients who had higher dose of this uh, mRNA therapy, they already uh, were permanently treated. And one day, one year after the initial initial injection, they still not making this toxic protein in their liver. So they already it is also a very successful uh, outcome. I can't imagine how it's possible for you to sit still and not be absolutely giddy with the excitement of what the possibilities are going forward into the future. It, it sounds just incredible to me. Yeah, yeah it, it truly is. So uh, you, you must feel like you must feel like rock stars doing this kind of work. And, uh, you know, I, you've had this tremendous success and there's so much, uh, as you pointed out, that, you know, that's opening for the future of uh, RNA in this. So what kinds, of, what kinds of things are you working on, you know, next? I mean, every, everybody knows about, you know, what you're working on, what you've done so, you know, so far for this and how it applies to the uh, current pandemic situation. But so what, what's your pet project, shall we say, of what you're working on? Can we talk about this now? Do we have to sign a, a non-disclosure agreement of some sort in order to ask you about that? Drew can talk. I, I can tell you a few. So we're working on a cure for sickle cell anemia. And what, so to, to, sickle cell is a disease of bone marrow stem cells that they make a, a, an incorrectly folded hemoglobin gene. Hemoglobin is what makes your red cells red. Mm -hmm. the, the current treatments are terrible and the disease is absolutely horrible. 
The problem is 200,000 people a year are born with sickle cell, namely in Africa and India. So any therapy has to be easy to deliver and inexpensive. Mm -hmm. We're working on a way to give a single injection of RNA LNPs that will cure sickle cell anemia. If we do that, it has huge expansion to hundreds of other genetic diseases. We're working on a variety of therapies, delivering RNA that will treat a disease and, and either cure or make that disease better. The, you know, the, the potentials are really enormous. We didn't even mention the antibodies, the mRNA coding for antibodies, which is, uh, you know, fastest growing section of the product, uh, pharmaceutical product in these days, and it is very, very expensive. But uh, we didn't mention that the RNA makes uh, most of this uh, medicine is not just accelerate the development, but also makes them cheap and affordable. And so, you know, that's also a, a, a process which uh, companies are looking at and uh, they are actually clinical trial are running and uh, uh, developing uh, different uh, uh, messenger RNA coding for antibodies against cancer or against infectious diseases. Yeah, this is, these are, uh, these are, let me see how I describe this now. Uh, it, it, Again, these are truly amazing, and it's fantastic to hear about this. I, I hope that you know, the rest of, of the world and that there's a bigger audience for this program so people can understand what this amazing work is that you're doing. This is an entirely, seems like an entirely new sort of like future direction of, of therapies for these kinds of issues and problems. Um, the, the ways in which these therapies are, are being administered now, you know, outside of the vaccine, uh, seem to be, you know, more of a in, a, in a different setting, a more professional, a more complex setting. Do you see these technologies eventually getting to the point where they are delivered in the same way that a vaccine is delivered? Is that the way in which you see this happening? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, we're looking for simple, easy treatments that cure diseases. And you, know, you might have to inject it instead of taking a pill, but you know, the hope is one injection will cure a genetic disease. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's gonna revolutionize medicine. Previously, you did a bone marrow transplant. Um, it, it, it's a big difference. And of course, you know, the <clears throat> mRNA is uh, delivered locally, delivered uh, intramuscular injection or intravenously, but uh, uh, definitely the big uh, progress will be, and already in, uh, is happening, that uh, the messenger RNA is put in, uh, wrapped up in a way that some molecules are there which will direct uh, to certain type of cells or organs so that you inject systemically, but those RNA will end up in the heart or the liver, or specific cell types or in a bone marrow, what Drew just mentioned. So, so this uh, will simplify uh, many of the therapy as uh, Drew also mentioned this. Did you ever expect that your work would have such broad impact when you were first beginning? I mean, I knew that it is will be important and but, uh, you know, of course, uh, you, you don't expect that there will be, uh, you know, a pandemic or I, I don't because I am not a, a virologist and uh, Drew is a virologist and immunologist and he might uh, expect it that there will happen, but uh, I did not expect it. I, I thought that someday it, it would be useful, probably in the setting of a pandemic but I, I was thinking influenza and nothing as massive as what we've just been through. I mean, the, the, this is, you know, not, not since 1918 have we seen a, a pandemic like this. Fantastic, really fantastic. Okay, so, so folks, we have, a, we have some questions from our audience. So uh, they're in our Q&A box and I'm gonna start with the first question here. And the first question comes from, uh, from Jerry Moss. And the question is, 
Are the modifications made to the mRNA similar to the natural five cap and three tail that are added after RNA transcription? I have no idea what yes. I just said. Yes, uh, five prime is that things. Five prime, but, thank you. You know, one end and the other end, but uh, uh, the messenger RNA in the vaccine is uh, the natural, uh, it just looked like the natural RNA and uh, all components in it is natural. And uh, I might say that the RNA is made uh, uh, synthetically. So there is no cell is involved uh, to produce it. And uh, every component is well defined. And uh, it has a three prime tail. It is we, when we transcribe from a template, we already transcribe with the had a poly A tail, which is a defined length and the five prime cap we incorporate uh, co-transcriptionally. And the modification is incorporated because all of the uridine is changed to, in the vaccine is one methyl of pseudouridine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the, the modifications are a chemical change to one of the letters uh, that make up the RNA code. But that nature, that the changes is present in our body also. So it is not uh, this change we also introduce. And actually, what that time when we work with the uh, Drew with the developing and discovering, we didn't know that messenger RNA has pseudo uridine. It was like 2014, three paper published that uh, demonstrated that our mammalian, our own messenger RNA also has this uh, modification, but we didn't know because it was very difficult to demonstrate. But uh, we have all of these modification. Pseudouridine itself is the fifth most abundant nucleoside in our body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you did mention the term uridine, which I read a little bit about. Can you just talk a little bit more about that, please? I mean, uh, from our RNA uh, is for, contains four different uh, nucleosides, and um, and one of them is the uridine, and uh, uh, we changed it the uridine when we synthesized the RNA from the triphosphate uh, the, uh, derivative, and uh, we used the pseudouridine uh, triphosphate, and the enzyme which we are used, uh, it was a phage RNA polymerase. Actually, this is also used to generate uh, the vaccine, T7 RNA polymerase is used from the template and then added to this transcription reaction for basic uh, nucleotide triphosphate, the enzyme, the template, and uh, some buffer, and that's how you make it. And, uh, and then uh, during transcription, when you are producing, so it will have the polyate, it has the cap, and the final product is ready. And it's like a very quick process, like from the template in one hour, you can have your RNA. Wow. You put on the cell, and then depending on the length of the protein, 15 minutes later, you put on the cell and the protein is made. And uh, this RNA, I have seen that, you know, they ask that how long this RNA is stable, but, um, you know, it, even the nucleoside modified RNA, which is more stable than the conventional one, is uh, probably three, four days, and this is all that great. Right, that was one of, mm -hmm. in fact, that was one of the questions, how long in hours or days does the RNA survive mm -hmm. after injection of the vaccine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That's why we had to keep in very low temperature, you know, because it's very labile. You, without even an enzyme, it just uh, standing by itself. It is uh, this. Uh, this is why from the dinosaurs, you know, they never isolated RNA. This, they can isolate DNA, but never mm -hmm. RNA because it is so labile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question we have here is: um, Do you see treatment? for Alzheimer's or perhaps could there be an mRNA vaccine uh, for cancer? So we're working on vaccines for Alzheimer's. Um, we're, we're in, they're in animal studies right now, uh, but th that, is, that is one of our goals. We're working on ALS and, another other, and a few other neurodegenerative disorders. There have been, so cancer vaccines were the first vaccine made with mRNA. And, and that went into patients probably 1994, 93, something in that area reported in 95. 
So RNA cancer vaccines have been around for a long time. They're much more sophisticated now and are showing better efficacy. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. So uh, my next question here is, we have a few more questions we can ask. Um, let me just see here if I can synthesize this one really quickly. I'm sorry, it's taking me a minute to do this. Oh, are the side effects attributed to the mRNA or the lipid? I can see one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we already know that the mRNA is quite silent and the lip, one of the lipid component actually, which is the adjuvant, which is the immune stimulant. And uh, so that's maybe, Drew would agree that maybe more of the side effect is related to the lipid formulation. You know, it, 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 it's definitely because we, so we, we identified that the LNP is an adjuvant. An adjuvant means it induces inflammation. When we don't put RNA in the lipid nanoparticle, we get the exact same symptoms. So the, 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 the lipids are what is giving people the, the sore arm, the feeling lousy uh, mm -hmm. symptoms. But this uh, vaccine has four different uh, lipids and uh, one of the lipid which causing this, uh, which is adjuvant, which is the stimulant. For example, we do not put in, in those formulation when we try to use the messenger RNA against uh, to uh, vaccinate uh, and induce uh, tolerization for autoimmune disease. So then it doesn't contain that kind of uh, stimulatory molecule because you want to reach tolerance, not immune activation. I have two last questions I, I'd like to ask of you. We, we couldn't really complete the evening if we didn't ask this question that comes from Crystal Denlinger. And her question is, what advice can you give young or junior investigators who are just starting out in science? So you know, the, there are a lot of things. The, the, the principal thing is that Science is a career, it, it's very difficult, it's hard to get jobs, it's hard to get grants, uh, funding, but, but, but it's a job that constantly opens your mind and, and it allows you to think. And, and I, I don't know, because I haven't done other jobs, but there aren't a lot of jobs that, that make you think. Uh, so if, if you enjoy exploring in developing new ideas, new, new new treatments, new understandings, then science is for you. If you're happy flipping burgers in a McDonald's, then science is probably not for you. Or if you want to have a lot of money, you know, that is not, <laughs> not this, or, or want fame and being in the limelight is, is a not guarantee, you know, that you have to be able, like um, I was um, working for 40 years, I never get any award, I never even get an R01 grant, and, uh, but I still could uh, manage because I had always at least one, two person that uh, supported my salary and and for me it was still a lot of excitement and and happiness because uh, when I was in the laboratory I was in a full control and then well whoever I can say to these young people you have to be you have to enjoy what you are doing so that's very important because you will go every day to work and then you have to have that excitement, anticipation that, okay, if I do this experiment and two days later, I will learn. And is it this, or this is that way? And then you get the third, you know, you try to answer one question and you get more questions mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of the answer, but mm -hmm. you have to enjoy it, you know, and that's what is important. You have to read a lot. You have to learn a lot of things and, uh, and that's, and that's fun. It must be uh, tremendously exciting for you. You stand right on the edge of a, of a, of a brand new world out there. Um, at, as we close, uh, Benjamin Franklin was an incredibly curious person. He never tired of asking questions about the world around him. Can you talk briefly about how curiosity and inquiry have played a role in your work? I mean, everything we do is curiosity in, in, in one sense of the word or another. 
you know, we, we describe it as just wanting to understand, wanting to learn how things work, wanting to learn the, the, the you know, the science and, and using that to develop new therapies, new ideas, new approaches. I mean, I, you know, curiosity is, is the, the exact definition of, of what a scientist does. And it is like, you know, solving a crossword puzzle and even you ask the question and you try to find the answer for it. And so it is, uh, it's very exciting. And, um, and uh, many times those little cues, you know, you find just like in, uh, you know, the, um, uh, uh, in the crime scene, you know, when you are looking some of this film and, uh, uh, Colombo, that the little thing will lead to. So it seems everything's this way, and then you find this little thing, and then it seems, oh, maybe it is that way, and and that's the excitement, you know. And uh, yeah, that's wonderful. We have absolutely one last question. The very last one we have is: Is there anything being researched with mRNA to change the message in retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa? So, you know, uh, people at Penn have already developed one gene therapy for retinal diseases. Um, I, I don't know of any RNA therapeutics for retinosal pigmentosa, but it certainly is possible. You know, I, I certainly don't know what everybody in the world uh, of, of RNA research is doing. It, it certainly is a subject that will be addressed in the future. Yeah, there are some RNA, uh, there are eye drops uh, developed delivering RNA, but not for that disease. But, uh, you know, it is obviously something to deliver to the lung, even, you know, vaccine to swallow, to take orally. There are science and research papers are out that uh, people are trying to do those things. And, uh, you know, just like we, they keep trying and then succeeding. We will see. We will see. <laughs> uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating hour. I have learned so much, as I certainly hope our audience has too. I want to thank both of you so much for taking this time, for joining us tonight. This has been just an, an amazing journey into uh, looking into the future of the therapies for all of these uh, diseases. And so thank you very much for your work. Uh, and congratulations to you on your award. Again, we look forward to seeing you on Thursday evening. And uh, I also want to thank our audience. Thank you for all of your great questions. And please join us uh, for the Franklin Institute Awards Ceremony, which will be live streamed this Thursday evening at 7 p.m. You'll find the link at our website at www.fi.edu slash awards. And we invite you to join us uh, for that program. Again, that's on Thursday evening at 7, and 7, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Dr. Carrico and Dr. Weissmus, again, this has been just wonderful. Thank you so very much. We look forward to seeing you on Thursday and uh, good luck in all your work in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all of the, those who watched us today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll say good night, and our broadcast will end in just a moment. Thanks. See you later. <laughs>